Salish peoples of this land, the land that touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Squamish, Trevada, and Muckleshoot nations. So welcome to the spring seminar series. Uh, it uh, is a great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Sabrina Breyer, uh, who uh, is a postdoc in, the, in my lab and Tim's lab um, and comes to us from Southern California. So she's probably almost climatized now after a couple of months. That's true. Yeah. So Sabrina obtained her BS degree from UC Santa Barbara, and then she got an MS degree from Auburn University. I didn't realize it was in aquaculture. Uh, it, well, it fisheries. Fisheries. It fisheries at Andar. Uh, she then obtained her PhD from UC Santa Cruz at the end of last year, uh, where in addition to doing some awesome research, which we'll hear about today, publishing lots of papers, uh, she mentored a horde of undergrads, volunteers, so um, not just doing the research, but really contributing to, to mentoring the next generation. Um, between her master's degree and her PhD, she worked um, at UC Santa Cruz and the Southwest Fishery Science Center as a, um, as, as a, as a biologist. Um, and in, as in, in, in her work there and subsequently, she's collaborated with quite a number of SAF alums, uh, some of whom I believe are on the call because they missed her PhD defense and want to hear more. Uh, Sabrina's main research interests uh, lie at the intersection of fish ecology, life history, and conservation and management. And we'll hear a little bit about today about that today. Um, in particular, she uses life history research to inform uh, management, assessments, um, and conservation. Uh, she's currently a, a postdoc, um, and uh, in addition to doing to developing her research program, she's doing her very first model-led stock assessment of Rexol, which I'm told will come out really well in lots and lots of Rexol, but we'll see. Um, but today, we're not going to learn about stock assessment. Uh, she's going to be talking about some of her PhD research, Title Reproductive Plasticity in the Long Lived Life there in California, Rockfishes. Over to you, Sabrina, and thank you for doing it. Great. Great. Thank you, Andre, for the introduction. And I hope you can all hear me. We don't have a microphone today, but um, let me know if, if I get a little quiet. I don't think I will. Um, like Andre said, I'm going to be talking today about work that I did as part of my PhD at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And I'd like to acknowledge um, the contributions of my PhD advisor, Suzanne Alonzo, and my NOAA mentors, John Field and uh, Sue Sogard. And um, I'll talk about some of their contributions throughout this talk as well. Um, but I just like to acknowledge that this is uh, some work coming out of um, my PhD researchers. Let's see if we can advance. Uh, I think we got to click the screen. Okay. So first off, let's uh, start with a definition. So what is phenotypic plasticity? So it's the production of multiple phenotypes from a single genotype, depending on the environment. So how traits differ depending on the environment that they're in. And for this talk, I'm, I'm going to be talking about phenotypic plasticity on two different scales. So I'm gonna be talking about plasticity of traits within an individual or within a group of individuals through time. So these rockfishes are long lived, their traits may vary through time. And then for the second part of the talk, I'm gonna be talking about plasticity among groups of individuals that are distributed in different habitats through space. So along the coast of California. So why study phenotypic plasticity of reproductive traits? Well, successful reproduction is critical to the growth, stability and persistence of populations, right? This is population dynamics 101 that you all know much better than I know about, but population dynamics 101, what sets the number of fish in a population, it's inputs through births and immigration and outputs through death and emigration. And this talk is gonna focus very specifically on reproduction and reproductive success. And when I talk about reproductive success, I'm gonna be talking about egg production, which of course um, is a component of reproductive success, which also includes larval survival and then recruitment to these populations. We're going to be focusing mainly on egg production today. So also, if the environment influences reproduction, you know, do we expect shifts in the reproductive potential of these populations? And what does that mean moving forward with climate change? 
Um, often in population modeling, the life history parameters that we model, uh, we model them as static through time. And this is not because we don't think that they change through time. It's because we have really a lack of data and a lack of kind of information about how these processes work. So an understanding how and why reproductive traits vary in response to an environmental change will improve our, our predictions of population dynamics. So this is the study system that I've been working in. It's the rockfishes of the, the California current ecosystem. So, oh, that didn't come out super great, but um, there is a map of, of land there somewhere, um, but the California current runs um, from north to south along the US West Coast. It's broadly divided into three biogeographic regions, the north, central, and south, that I'll be talking a little bit more about on the next slide. And then the rockfishes of the California currents, they're, they're highly diverse. So there's over 100 species worldwide. There's a hot spot of diversity off the coast of California where there's over 65 species, which make them great for biologists to study, right? There's unlimited amount to study. And for managers, it's a little bit more complicated because they each have a slightly different life, life history strategy. The one thing uni that unites them is that they're, they're all live bearers and they all invest a lot into reproduction. Um, so I'm not sure if I can, you can see, but you can actually see that these are this one brown rockfish up there, you can see their, their swollen abdomens. So they actually have internal fertilization and they gestate these larvae or these eggs and develop them into larvae over a period of weeks to months and then release them into the wild. So let's talk a little bit about how the environment varies through time in the California current and then also through space. So for this talk, I'm gonna be using information um, from the North Pacific Gyre Oscillation Index. And essentially there's you know, different climate events that affect productivity of the system. These can be such as um, El Nino years where there's warmer waters in the system, they're slightly less productive or La Nina years where there's cooler water in the system. And the NPGO basically tracks um, the physical conditions that influence biological, biological productivity in the system and seems to track well with other um, biological properties. Um, so we have some years that are more productive and some years that are less productive through time. In terms of spatial variation, um, like I mentioned, we have three biogeographic -geogra regions of the California current, and they differ in temperature, they differ in seasonality, and they differ in, in ocean productivity. So we're, we're gonna be focusing a little bit more on the South, which is there it's warmer temperatures in the South, weaker seasonality, and this idea that there's sort of overall less productivity. And we're gonna see how that influences reproduction in these fishes. So a little bit about rockfish, uh, a little more about rockfish reproduction. Um, so some of their life history that I mentioned, they're live bearers, um, but they're highly fecund. These little larvae are only five to seven millimeters in length when they're born. Uh, they're moderate to long lived. So species can live you know, upwards of hundred years, but many um, are often much shorter lived than that. And for today's talk, I'm gonna be focusing on the shelf species that tend to reproduce over the winter months. And the really neat thing about working with these rockfish is that there's already a lot of information known about rockfish, um, such as the influence of maternal size on how they reproduce. Um, and this has influenced some um, cool named uh, hypotheses, such as the Boff hypothesis, which is this idea that these big, old, fat, fecund female fish are important to, um, to population dynamics. Yes, it's the Boff hypothesis. Um, and I will say, actually, one note, Steve Berkeley, who helped develop that hypothesis, hated that acronym. Just <laughs> So I think that was a Mark Hickson thing. Um, not quite sure about that. But um, anyway, so we, we know a lot about, about how size influences reproduction in these fish. So we're going to build off that knowledge. So in terms of temporal variation, we have some information that during El Nino conditions, the body conditions of these of these feet, of these um, of these rockfishes are reduced and their gonad sizes are reduced, but we haven't quantified what that means in terms of egg production. And then in terms of spatial variation, so there's intra-specific and interspecific differences in terms of spatial variation, and in terms of how often these fish reproduce. So the most common strategy for these fishes is to produce, once they're mature, a single brood of larvae per year. However, in the south, in the southern region, um, we have at least 15 species um, that are capable of greater than one brood per year. And so that's sort of a different reproductive strategy. And within these species that can be broadly distributed along the entire coast, it's individuals that live in the South that produce multiple broods. And then in the central area and North, they'll produce single broods and even up North into Alaska. Um, and when conditions are not good, you might even have skip spawning occurring. 
So spatial variation in the frequency of reproduction. And so some of the implications, well, this variation in reproductive traits really hampers our efforts to assess population reproductive potential. So we'd like to know more about this. So for, for our research question, we're looking at what are the causes and consequences of plasticity and reproductive traits? And this has been our overall working hypothesis for much of the work that I do. And this idea that the environment influences maternal energy reserves and influences reproductive output. So we have something, um, you know, something in the environment that's influencing primary productivity, that's in influencing the you know, prey quantity and quality that influences basically the feeding success of these individuals. Obviously, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but once these, uh, once these individuals acquire food, they need to make some decisions about how they're going to allocate those energetic resources, right? So some of that gets paid to metabolic costs, but then some of that can be used to either grow larger or to, to reproduce. And while we would like to know kind of you know, the specifics of the system, we often have imperfect observations, right? So I'm going to be talking about ocean indices, such as the North Pacific Gyre Oscillation Index for, for a proxy for environmental conditions. I'm going to be talking about the Fulton's K body condition factor, which is essentially a measure of weight, the length of the fish. So essentially how fat a fish is given its length as a proxy for energy reserves. And I'm going to be talking about fecundity as a proxy um, for total, you know, energet energetics that are that are um, going into reproduction and one component of, of reproductive success. Okay, so how and why does reproductive effort vary first through time is going to be the first portion of my talk, and then we'll come back and we'll we'll think about this through space. And so the methods that I've used to look at this question um, are through field work, and I'm going to be talking about a 20 year time series of brood sizes and how they vary for four shelf species in California in central California. I've also looked at this through theory, and so that's going to be the second part of my talk. And this idea that seasonality really sets up the timing and frequency of reproduction in these species. And then what I won't be talking about today, but I do have information on is a lab study where we actually brought uh, rosy rockfish into the lab. Um, they're a small species, but we manipulated water temperature and food availability and saw how that influenced uh, the number of broods that they produce and brood sizes. Okay, so this is uh, the first part of the talk looking at temporal variation. Um, and this is a chapter that's currently in, in review with NOAA. Um, titled Reproductive Plasticity in Long-Lived Live-Bearing Rockfishes as part of a life strategy to cope with this interannual uh, environmental variability in the system. So I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors on this, uh, Sue Sogard, Dave Stafford, Neosha Kashef, um, Abel Rodriguez, who is um, actually here at the University of Washington. He's the chair of the stats department and happens to be my husband. Um, <laughs> So, and also as well as my, my PhD advisor, uh, Suzanne Alonzo, and um, my NOAA mentor, John Field. Okay, so for this portion of the talk, we're going to be focusing on four shelf rock fish species, the yellowtail rockfish, widow rockfish, the chili pepper, and the boccaccio, and a couple of differences in their, in their life history. The yellowtail and widow rockfish, they are very long, fairly long-lived. They live about 65 years or so, um, and they have the most common reproductive strategy, so they're single brooders. Uh, they produce only a single brood of larvae per year once they're mature. Now, chili pepper and boccaccio, they are slightly different. Um, chili pepper only live about 35 years, and they are both species that are capable of doing multiple broods. But again, it's the individuals in the south that are the ones doing the multiple broods. And then in the central region, we sometimes see it in some years, sometimes don't. Historically, we didn't think it was occurring in the central region, and we have no reports of multiple brooding up north. And so this, uh, this I should have mentioned this first, um, we're gonna be focused on Central California for this part of the study to look at differences in brood sizes through time. And I'll say it's not gonna be totally satisfying because I can't really account for multiple brooding in Central California in this data set. So we're gonna focus on how the brood sizes change through time. And then we'll return to this idea of multiple brooding um, that mainly occurs in the South later on. Um, and then also we're gonna, again, look through um, we're, what we're going to do in this study is see how variability in brood sizes correlates um, with differences in ocean productivity and how, um, how body condition influences reproduction in the species. Okay, so here are some of our methods. This is the fun part of the project, right? We get to go out in the field and collect these fish. So um, unfortunately, it's not showing up very well, but we're in Central California here where that star is. And our study site is at Cordell Bank. Um, it's this seamount, this really cool geographic deep, about 25 miles off the coast of California. It's part of a National Marine Sanctuary. 
And to do this work, we actually had to, there's no surveys done in the winter months. We actually had to charter uh, small commercial boats or, um, or uh, um, these, these sport, sport fishing boats to, and bring anglers out with us to help us to collect these fish. So um, this was the exciting part of the field work. And so we went out, we collected these fish by hook and line methods, and then we brought them back into the lab. And so the one thing to take away here is we're sampling, you know, a single population through many years. Um, and I was brought on this project in 2009 and have done collections since 2009. And then we have some historical data sets that we're adding to this time series from the exact same location, same methods, actually from the same boat in the 1980s collecting the, uh, these same species. Okay, so what we do is we bring these fish back into the lab. We take basic, you know, length and weight, weight measurements. That's how we can calculate a Fulton's K condition factor, which tells us a little bit about um, body condition for these fish. And then we're collecting them in the winter. And so um, for any females that are developing eggs or have uh, fertilized embryos, we're going to take weighed subsamples of the, of the ovary. Um, and then we're actually going to count those eggs to estimate fecundity. But this is, so this is a chili pepper rock fish and there you're looking at the gonad, which probably has, you know, 100,000 little eyed larvae in there. Um, so that's what, what it looks like before, right before they're released. And then here's where, like Andre mentioned, I've had so many students, I think I've had about 65 student interns over the course of this project who have helped me count eggs and larvae. They got sick of doing it, so they decided to try a new method of where you just image the eggs. Um, and so, which is great, it goes much faster. And we have a paper that's currently in review that's co-authored by three of my interns. Okay, so this is kind of what, this is what the time series looks like. Um, so we have, like I said, I was brought on this project from 2009. Um, and we have some historical time series from one of our co-authors, Dave Stafford, during his master's uh, thesis, he worked at Cordell Bank and collected some of these species. And then uh, some of uh, this work on yellowtail rockfish was published by Eldridge and Jarvis in 1991. And some of this, this was kind of a cool story. We actually found these files at NOAA that had all of this historical information and we were able to key punch it and use it in this time series. So don't throw out old files, old data files. <laughs> it can be useful. Um, so some of that work was unpublished and we were able to use that. So the things to note here is that we were targeting yellowtail, rockfish, and chili pepper. So the sample sizes are much larger for these species. However, we would opportunistically uh, keep any widow rockfish or boccaccio because they intermingle with those species. And we thought, well, you know, we have some information. Let's put it in the, in the model and see if we can look at variation in brood sizes for them as well. Um, so obviously differences in, in, um, in sample sizes here. But 20 years of brood size data from a single location. Okay, so how we looked at this um, is what we're gonna do is we're gonna model fecundity as a function of length, because we know length is so important in these species. And we're using a Bayesian hierarchical linear, linear model. So we're gonna model log fecundity as a function of log length. And then we're gonna look at differences in the intercept and in the slope of this relationship, right? So this is a very flexible model um, and it's visualized here. So uh, we're gonna look at differences in say, you know, environmental conditions, maybe they increase and they're good for all sizes of fish, small and large fish. So maybe you have an increase in the scaling factor, which would be uh, shown here from like year one to year two, or maybe there's something in the environment that maybe only large fish respond to environmental factors um, instead of small fish that are still growing, right? Um, so you could have some interaction term. So this, um, this model is highly flexible. We're using year as a random effect um, to look at variability between year. Uh, some other things. Um, so model fitting using Bayesian probability and MCMC. I was using the BRIMS package, which if you're not familiar with that, but you work with linear hierarchical models, uh, it has the same syntax, which is great. So if you're making that transition over to Bayesian methods, and then the priors, obviously you have to think a lot about priors, but we're using some um, advice that's, that's published in the literature. And then for this model, we're building off of another model that was um, specific for the fecundity length relationship published by um, EJ Dick um, and others, including myself in, in 2017. So that's the base model that we're going to use to quantify variation by year. And then what we what we did is we fit, well, we did kind of sequential model fitting, but we came up with a full model that's also going to include this Fulton's K body condition factor um, as a predictor on expected brood sizes, as well as the mean summer and fall uh, MPGO conditions as an environmental predictor on the random effect of year. So it's going to 
be a predictor on what this relationship looks, by, looks like by year. And we're using the summer and fall because that's when these fish are gaining energy. And so their, their body condition is getting, getting growing through, uh, through the summer and the fall and it really peaks right before winter reproduction. Okay, so this is some of the results that we've seen. And I realize you're looking at lots and lots of dots. These are called dot charts, aptly named. Um, and I'm gonna focus just for the sake of time, mainly, mainly on yellowtail because it's the, the species we have the most data on, but it is also the species we see the most variation. Okay, so what you're looking at is on the x-axis, you're looking at expected brood size from the model. On the y-axis, you're looking at through time and you're looking at what, the years where we have data. And then what you're looking at, because there can be this interaction of length, um, you're looking at uh, fish of different sizes. So green dots are small fish, the length at which 50% of the females in the population are mature, and that's coming from assessments. Um, and then purple is you're looking at large fish. So you're looking at an, and the asymptotic length for, um, for these populations that are also coming from, from assessments. And then the yellow dots are the mean sample sizes for fish in our study. And you can see kind of the size frequency of fish that we collected in our study relative to these reference points. Okay, and then black dots, what you're looking at is actually the slope of the length fecundity relationship. And so you're seeing that it's actually varying through time, uh, which is kind of a, a cool uh, result that we found. That some in some years, these large females, not only do they have greater relative fecundity, but some years it's, it's really high and some years it's not as high compared to those small fish. So what you can see is there is variation in brood size through year for small fish, but it's really present, especially in large fish, right? So if you're looking through time at these purple dots, especially for yellowtail, and kind of looking at the magnitude of difference is from a, you know, a poor fecundity year to a good fecundity year within our time series, a single yellowtail rockfish that's 521 millimeters could have a difference of over 1.5 million larvae in that brood, right? So that's a single fish from a bad year to a good year. Um, so that's really incredible. Um, and then for widow rockfish, we found that the difference was similar. There can be large differences in the brood sizes of a single individual through time. And then for chili pepper and, and for boccaccio, uh, we did find differences in brood size through time, but it wasn't as great. And that's kind of interesting. They have this different life history strategy, and maybe the variability is actually the production of a second brood, right, that we couldn't account for that would actually make uh, variation from year to year quite high as well. Okay, so when we added in um, our predictors of body condition and the MPGO, we found that body condition greatly explained uh, uh, variation in brood size as well as maternal length. And then we also found that the MPGO had this weak but positive correlation with variation in that length fecundity, fecundity relationship through time. So what you're looking at, at is the summer and fall MPGO plotted on the x-axis, and you're looking at the differences in the slope of this relationship through time. And so when conditions are good, it's really those large females that are really ramping up their, their reproductive effort um, during those years. And that seems to be a pattern across all four species that we see. Okay, so takeaways from 20 plus years of fecundity collections in Central California. Um, I hope I've, I've provided some evidence that there is high interannual variation in brood size. And some of the causes is that they, it's been correlated with um, maternal length, but also body condition that's gonna vary from year to year. And we did find um, you know, a weak correlation with the summer and fall ocean feeding conditions with the MPGO um, with differences in the length fecundity relationship through time. So the consequences of some of this work, well, if you're thinking about this, there's thousands to millions more or less larvae per female, depending on environmental conditions, right? So this suggests you know, high variation in population reproductive potential changing depending on how the environment changes through time. And so kind of an idea here is that phenotypic plasticity and brood size, you know, along with other life history characteristics, such as a long lifespan, you know, this is likely adaptive, right? So these fish, when they encounter these poor conditions, you know, one strategy is to, you know, not reproduce as much during those years. And that's kind of a survival method, right? And then once those good conditions come along, especially these large females, they just can just go gangbusters, right? And they can just ramp up reproductive effort when those good conditions come along. Um, but something to think about, right, as conditions change, what are those good conditions, what are not those good, good conditions? Um, so uh, hopefully I've shown you some evidence, you know, that the environment is influencing maternal uh, energy reserves and reproductive output. 
Okay, so how and why does reproductive effort vary? We've talked a little bit about this through time. So high temporal variation in grid sizes influenced by changes in energy reserves and the environment. So let's switch over and talk a little bit about spatial variation. Um, and we're going to do this with theory, and um, we're going to talk about how spatial, vari spatial variation in the frequency of reproduction. Uh, and this is going to be an introduction to state-dependent life history models and bioenergetics. Okay, so this uh, chapter of my PhD was titled State-Dependent Life History Theory Predicts Spatial Variation in the Life History Traits of California Current Rockfishes. Um, and again, I'd like to acknowledge the work of my co-authors, John Field and Sue, Suzanne Alonzo, um, as well as the contributions of Mark Mangle, who has written books and papers and, and all of that on SDP models that I'll be talking about um, and has contributed to this project, as well as Chris Harvey, who is here at the Northwest Fishery Science Center, the NOAA lab here. And Chris developed a rockfish bioenergetics model that I was able to use in this model, in the STP model. And he also helped me take those equations and put them in the model. Okay, so let's revisit some of the spatial um, variation in the environment and in how these fish reproduce. So what I'm going to be focusing on for this part of the talk is spatial variation in temperature, seasonality, and ocean productivity, with this idea that in the south, the temperatures are a bit warmer, the seasonality is weaker, and then also this idea that ocean productivity may not be quite as high as compared to the other regions. Now, in the other regions, central and northern uh, regions, obviously the, the temperatures are cooler, but these, these regions are really driven by upwelling dynamics in the spring, right? So they have high seasonality in these upwelling dynamics that drive you know, primary and secondary productivity in these, in these systems. So what we see in terms of how this, you know, what's going on in these rockfishes is that we do see more multiple brooding in the south. And this is some data coming from um, a study by Lindsay Lefebvre and others in our group where we went out and we sampled uh, the chili pepper and we, we sampled them in, in Central California and Southern California. We tried to get some collections from Northern California. We were not successful, um, but we see this pattern, right? So we see again, um, maternal length on the x-axis. We see this influence of maternal size again. And then what you're looking at on the y-axis is the probability of being a multiple brooder. So it's either you're a single brooder or you have some probability of being of producing multiple broods in a year. And so some of the differences that we see is that there is just a higher probability of multiple brooding in the south, and these um, the squares and the circles are, are observations that we have. And so other things is that the, the females in the south, they, they tend to start reproducing at smaller sizes, and they don't grow quite as big. Now, in the central region, um, like I mentioned before, um, historically, we didn't think multiple brooding actually happened in the central region. There were some studies that went out and looked for it and didn't find it. Um, but in more recent years, we've seen more evidence of multiple brooding. And this study was actually from uh, some of those years that we did see it. And we did see a very strong influence of maternal size. So it was really mostly the, the, the large females um, in the central region that were producing multiple broods. So our question is really, you know, what's going on and what's driving these dif differences? And we think, you know, it's something in the environment that, that's driving these differences. Okay, so our approach for this, um, this part of the talk is we're gonna use state-dependent life history theory model uh, using stochastic dynamic programming um, and what we know about rockfish bioenergetics. And we're gonna model adaptive variation in the frequency of reproduction for fish that live in different environments and see if that kind of tells us a little bit about why we see these patterns. So this is uh, what our model looks like. Um, we're gonna, we have two state variables in this model. So we're gonna be modeling length. Obviously length is very important to reproduction and energy stores. And specifically in the, mod in the model, I model kilojoules of energy, but if that's a little bit hard to think about, you can just think about modeling gra grams of fat storage tissues in these fish, right? And so we're going to be modeling energy dynamics on a one month time step. And at the beginning of the month, you have a fish where you have a known length and you have a known amount of energy and you can calculate a total weight for that fish. And then in, that, in this month, the fish is going to feed and gain food and then also pay those metabolic costs. And so we're going to calculate allometric energy gains and losses, which is going to come from these bioenergetic models. And here's where we're going to feed in these differences in temperature, in mean food in the environment, which is going to be a proxy for ocean productivity, and then seasonality in when that food is available. So we're going to look at those three factors. So after the fish feeds, um, 
we update the energy stores and there's either net energy gains or there's net energy losses. And then we come to the, um, the SDP portion of the model. So this fish needs to figure out how it should use this stored energy, right? Should it grow bigger? Should it reproduce? Should it, should it save that energy for the next time step? So we are gonna find the energy allocation strategy for U, which is energy that's allocated to growth, and R, which is energy allocated to reproduction, that maximizes expected lifetime fitness of the fish. And we're gonna use fecundity as a proxy for fitness. So we're making no assumptions about larval survival or anything like that. How you win this game is to produce as many eggs as possible over your lifetime. So what is V exactly? So it's the expected fitness value. It's the current fitness gains, gain from the current brood if you decide to re reproduce. Um, and the, ex the expected future fitness in the next time step discounted by a probability of surviving to that next time step. And that survival probability is actually a little bit less if you're reproducing in that month. So after you decide to, to, um, to grow and to reproduce at the end of the month, we update the energy stores and say, hey, does this fish have enough energy to survive starvation? And then also we model a stochastic mortality process. So there's some probability of surviving, some probability of dying, um, in which, like I said, you have a, a lower survival prob probability for the month when, when you reproduce. Okay, so how do um, STP models work? I mean, if you... The basic thing is there's a backwards version and then there's a forward version of this model. So what we do is we, we start off by working backwards through time to solve for these optimal allocation strategies. So we work backwards from the last month of life to the first. And we do this because at the very last month, we know what the expected fitness is. It's zero. The fish is dead. It's not going to survive any longer. And because we know that, we can work backwards month by month looping over all of the states of energy, all of, this, all of the states of length to determine, um, to solve for the combination of U and R, energy to growth and reproduction, that maximizes the, the expected lifetime fecundity. And again, for all, all different combinations. So once you do that, you're recording these optimal decisions in a decision matrix for every single time step. So you come up with decisions for like 18 million scenarios, right? So I'm, I'm a fish of this age, I have, I'm this length, and I have this much energy. What should I do? And this decision matrix tells you what to do if you were to behave optimally. Um, we're going to run this for different environmental scenarios and going to see what the emergent properties are that represent the adaptive life strategy for that environment that would be optimal. And then we're going to use, so how we visualize this, so you can't visualize that, right? That's, that's 18 million options, you can't visualize that. So we're going to use a forward simulation of an individual or a cohort of individuals from the age and size at recruitment to the maximum age to visualize these adaptive life strategies for these different environmental conditions. Okay, so I have actually set this model up for rosy rockfish. One of the reasons was because I worked with them in the lab and because we also have some field data from them. Uh, so rosy rockfish, they're small species. Um, they don't get very big, but they're capable of multiple brooding. They're broadly distributed throughout the West Coast. Um, and we also have some information from a master's thesis from Ryan Field's um, master's thesis at Moss Landing, providing us with some, with some field data about age and growth um, and differences in Central and Southern California. So into this model, I'm putting some biology into this model. Um, so we are gonna put a maximum size on this fish of around 30 centimeters, um, and we're gonna limit the growth rate, um, but, but growth is gonna be an emergent property of this, of this um, model. And then lifespan, there's a little bit of uncertainty in how old these fish get. Um, their otoliths are pretty hard to age. Um, in this master's thesis, uh, there was one fish that was aged at 32 years, it was a male, and it seems like maybe there, there wasn't as much information um, on longevity for females, but they might be a little bit um, lesser long-lived than males, it's possible. Um, so we're going to model actually the lifespan up to 35 years, realizing that most fish are not going to make it to 35 years, so that's going to be a parameter in our, in our model. We're going to model annual mortality of around 0.2, and this information is coming from catch curves from, from some of that study. And like I said, there's a, a slightly less um, probability of surviving during the month of reproduction that goes into the model. Uh, we have some information on fecundity, so we're going we're gonna to limit gonad sizes. They can't just be a huge gonad fish, although they do get pretty fat. So that's a, a gestating um, rosy rockfish in the bottom there. Um, and then the, some constraints on energy reserves, right? So we see 
we, we know the body condition of, of fish in the wild and they can't really be less than a certain point, right? Because otherwise they're going to starve. But they're also, you know, they're fairly small. They can't store a, a, an infinite amount of energy. So we're going to set some limits on um, these energy reserves. But again, growth and reproduction are emergent properties of this model. And so we're just using the biology to set some of these constraints. Okay, so here are... 18 different environmental scenarios that I'm, I'm looking at, okay? And I'm doing this kind of as an experimental design so I can understand, you know, how does each of these, um, each of these environmental variables influence uh, reproductive patterns in these fish. So we're gonna model two temperature regimes, a cooler and warmer temperature regime. And then we're gonna model three levels of mean food in the environment, kind of as a proxy for ocean productivity. So high, medium, and low. And then three levels of the strength of seasonality. So, so weak seasonality all the way up to really strong seasonality. And so where, how I'm doing this is um, some of this is coming from, from bioenergetics, from those rockfish bioenergetic models. Um, some of this is coming from data. So we do have some data of temperature at depth for these species. So um, cooler temperatures are going to be modeled similar to temperatures in central California. Warmer are, are temperatures similar to southern California. And then what's really neat from these rockfish bioenergetic models is that they, we have some known um, we have known temperature dependence functions on how temperature influences the consumption rates and the respiration rates in, in these uh, species, which is super cool. Um, so we can model exactly how temperature is affecting the bioenergetics in, in these fish. So in terms of the feeding function, we're gonna come up with this, we're gonna use mean food in the environment and when that food is available to come up with a seasonal feeding function. And then we're gonna feed this into the bioenergetics. So we have, we're modeling allometric gains and losses. So we have an equation for the consumption rate, which is based off the size of the fish, but also based off of temperature and also based off of the amount of food in the environment, which I don't know, I think that's super cool that we can do this. Um, and then we're gonna model, um, so we're gonna model energy losses through respiration and then other, um, other metabolic costs as well that are just proportion, proportional to uh, consumption rates. Okay, so these are some of the results that come out of the model. Um, and I'm gonna go kind of step-by-step step and highlight some of the main, the main findings from this model. And one of the main findings, um, although I'm not focused on growth, um, growth you know, obviously is important to reproduction. And we found that mean food in the environment really had the strongest effect on growth. Um, so what you're looking at is, um, on, on the left here, is you're looking at age and years, all the way up to 35 years, um, and then you're looking at length on the y-axis, and you're looking at model outputs from um, fish in the cooler temperatures on top and warmer temperatures on the bottom. And then the different colors are uh, the different um, mean food, amount of mean food in the environment, and then the different line types is the differences in seasonality. So what you see, and then what you can't really see all that well is there are these little gray data points on here. And that's pulling from field data. And so I plotted that field data just to give you an idea of like how the model outputs compare to what we see in the field. And so if you really could see the data, um, you would see that fish in these, these medium feeding environments have about average growth for, for what we see in rosy rockfish. And then high food is, is pretty really good growth, but within kind of the param parameters of what we see in the wild. And then these low food environments is pretty, pretty darn poor growth um, and, and pretty, uh, pretty darn uh, poor um, feeding conditions. But again, these are um, emergent properties about how this fish should grow if it were to behave op optimally given the environment. So on the right, what we're looking at is survival. This is um, the only graph I'm going to show from this cohort forward simulation. So we started off with 100,000 individuals and then ran them through the model just to see, you know, how, how long do they actually live? And so many of them, most of them are not going to make it all the way to 35 years, which is what we expect. Um, so most of them, you know, will peter out and, will, and won't be more than like 15 or 20 years old. But that's sort of what we expect and what we see in the wild as well. Okay, so what does this mean? So more food resources lead to this expectation of these larger females. And because of that, they have these larger brood sizes and greater lifetime egg production. So these are just results from the, um, the cooler water temperature models. But here now you're looking at length on the x-axis and you're looking at brood size on the y-axis. You do see they kind of hit that constraint. That's why they're all in the line. 
Um, but you can see that females in the, in the high food uh, feeding in the high food environments, which are the blue dots, because they're so large, they're just producing so many more eggs than females in the um, in the uh, the poor food environment. So what this means is you have all this information in the model, you can calculate the expected lifetime egg production for these fish. And so the main difference is, is that you know, fish in high food environments, they're gonna produce many, many more eggs compared to fish in a, in a low food environment. And that's basically just due to these differences in growth. So now let's focus a little bit about on the results of seasonality and how seasonality effect influences reproduction. So what you're looking at here are graphs um, from all the model runs. You're looking at age on the x-axis and then the number of broods that they would be expected to produce in their environment, given that they behave optimally. Um, and right now we're just looking at fish from that were in the strongly seasonal environments, um, but are under all feeding regimes, so high, medium, and low, and then cooler temperatures and warmer temperatures um, on the top and bottom. And so we see that strong seasonality really favors the single brood strategy, right? So no matter the size or age of this fish, these females in these strongly seasonal environments, they should just produce a single brood, you know, no, no matter what, what food environment they're in. Um, and this is really because as you dig into the model, you can look at the energetics. It's because females in these strongly seasonal environments, they're actually dealing with a period during the year right after they reproduced where they have net energetic losses. And so they actually have to survive that period and, and, and use those energy stores to get through that period. And that seems to be driving kind of this output that they really should just produce single broods. And that, that's going to be the strategy that maximizes egg production for them in a strongly seasonal environment. So when you look at uh, environments that have moderate seasonality or weak seasonality, you do see more evidence for, of, of multiple brooding as the adaptive reproductive strategy. Um, and this does differ by the amount of food in the environment. And what was interesting is these low food environments is really where you, where you see fish starting to do multiple broods kind of at these younger ages, or just more evidence for, for multiple brooding um, as the adaptive strategy, given that they're in a low food environment that um, has weak or moderate uh, seasonality. So when I looked into this kind of, you know, why is this, what's driving this pattern? It's really that when the fish kind of stop growing is when they, 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 they reallocate that energy into these multiple broods, which, you know, makes sense. And then in these, you know, low food environments, they're going to stop growing pretty early on. They're pretty small fish. Okay. So also in terms of what seasonality influences. So it influences the timing of reproduction. So in this model, these fish could reproduce whenever they wanted to, right? So it's a monthly time step. They could reproduce in any month of the year. Um, but an emergent property of this model is that they're mainly reproducing in the winter, which is cool, right? So that's what we see in the, in the wild. Um, and it's based off these energy dynamics and when food is available. And we see that strong seasonality really restricts um, reproduction to those winter months. Um, and then moderate and weak seasonality favors some broods outside of the winter peak. So there's still a winter peak, even in weekly seasonal environments, but you could have some like second or third broods that happen throughout the year, which is kind of neat because that's sort of what we see in the central and northern regions. We see a very short, a shorter uh, spawning season for these fish. And then in the south, actually, if you talk with fishermen, they're saying, oh, rockfish spawn the entire year, all year round. That's what they'll say. Um, but we do see some evidence from our data that they have longer spawning seasons in the south as well. Okay, and then in terms of temperature, there was not a huge difference of effect of temperature in this model, and that's probably because we were, we didn't have a huge difference in the in the temperature regimes that we we're modeling. But we did see that there's slightly more broods outside of this winter peak in these warmer temperatures, um, and so that's kind of shown by these these summer months where there's some more broods um, occurring in warmer temperatures. Okay, so takeaways from an SDP, SDP model. So plasticity in life history traits is adaptive, right? So it's adaptive depending on differences in the environment and it's adaptive because it's a strategy to maximize egg production um, in these fish under different environmental conditions. And so the spatial variation that we see in growth and reproduction is really expected now, right? We have the math to show this across environments that differ in temperature, food and seasonality. 
So this STP model really shows the math, right, for the expected variation by modeling these trade-offs in energy allocation to growth, to reproduction, to how they should, should survive, and then also for future reproductive opportunities. So it has really broad application in ecology um, and also for fisheries. There's This technique can be used to answer a lot of behavioral um, uh, questions in ecology. So some of the consequences, well, this model, the results of this model suggest that multiple brooding in the south is adaptive um, because the seasonality is weaker and temperature is warmer, um, but also, you know, perhaps that the productivity is, is less there. Um, so if that really is the case, then females would be expected to be smaller and thus less, you know, less reproductively productive overall, even though they are producing multiple broods. Um, so that is, you know, some, some of the takeaways of, of this model. Okay, so we're getting to the end here, and hopefully I've shown you some um, evidence that reproductive plastic, plasticity occurs in, in rockfishes through both time and space. And also uh, so a framework for why variation in life history traits is really expected. And this is not just rock fishes, right? There's, or these species, there's other evidence that there's smaller fish in the South and larger fish in the North. And so this is providing one hypothesis based on the bioenergetics and based on, on the environment about why that, that could be occurring. And so some of the consequences are that, you know, we need to expect shifts in population reproductive potential when the ocean environment changes. And so I think some of the extensions of this work will be thinking about, you know, as conditions in the environment in the California current change, you know, we see more impacts of um, warming from these northern these um, northern blob events or El Nino's or La Nina's, you know, how are these conditions changing and how is that going to influence uh, the reproductive potential of these fish? And so some of the future directions that I, I just started in February, but I'm going to be working on for, for my postdoc is thinking about these ideas and how the environment and influences maternal uh, reproduction, and then how might that influence, you know, recruitment in these populations. So this is just um, an example from the, the 2015 chili pepper stock assessment that I helped on. But one of these things, one of the things that's characteristic about rockfishes is they have really high recruitment variability. So that's shown on the graph on the left. Um, and like really high uncertainty in these uh, stock recruitment curves, right? It's kind of, you know, here's the, here's the stock, but really, you know, productivity or recruitment could be this, this, or this. Um, so thinking about, you know, how, what we've gained in our knowledge about how the environment influences egg production and other studies, you know, showing how it influences larval survival, can we kind of build some knowledge around here about how these, um, how productive these stocks are given different environmental conditions moving forward. So those are some of the ideas that I'm thinking about um, for my postdoc, and I'd love to collaborate with anyone that's interested in this. Um, and uh, you can find me at, in Andre's uh, postdoc labs just down the hall. So come by and, and say hi anytime. Um, and then with that, I, there's so many people to acknowledge. Um, like I said, I had 65 student interns working on, on egg counting projects um, and so many others that helped out with, uh, with this work. So thank you to all. And with that, I will uh, take questions. Uh, take questions from the audience, and there's also probably some questions online. All right, over to you. Hi, go ahead. That was a super interesting talk. I was interested in well, two questions, one on each part of the talk, and sort of the second one with the modeling. Under low food, they mature at a smaller size, but at the same age. And I'm wondering if that's an artifact of um, an assumption of constant fraction of surplus energy goes to growth and reproduction. Is that a good assumption? Um, so age at, ma at maturity is really, there's a couple of things that come out of these models. Um, so the age at maturity can be set by um, the, more, the risk of mortality. That tends to be more influential on, on age at, at maturation instead of the energy dynamics. Um, so you just see like across all food environments, like if these fish were to die quickly, it would push the age at maturation earlier. So that's kind of a, you know, something that comes out of these models and is from life history um, research. And then I'm sorry, what was, I totally missed that. Same yeah. You have a rule in there that they, Surplus energy, constant fraction goes to reproduction. 
Yeah, they actually, so it, it looks like they're very similar age of maturation. It did differ a little bit by about a year or so. So the the um, the fish in the um, the low food environments were maturing like a year a year or two earlier than fish in the high food environments. So I don't think there's like something built into the model that's that's driving that. Um, Hopefully that sort of answers your question. But, and also I love these questions because every time I get a question, I can go back and explore these things in the model, which is super cool. Yeah, quick question on the first part. Um, all plasticities in fecundity, not in size of the, of the larva. Right, so that's a good point. So so some of the work by um, Sue Sogard, Steve Berkeley, is that in some of these species, um, uh, these older, larger females will produce larvae that have higher energy reserves. They're actually not bigger. It's just that they have uh, like a larger oil globule. That's more so actually, it hasn't been found in all the species, which is really interesting in some of the updates that we've done. Um, it's more so actually the spring spawners that are more near shore. Um, so there se seems to be something about like that oil globule is like super important for those um, for those species. Um, so yes, this is my, my um, the first part of the talk was only looking at fecundity. Um, and we have looked at, and it just, it, yeah, I, I don't have any evidence that, that larval size is changing through time. Um, and I haven't looked at oil globule size through time, um, but yeah, so this is, it's just based on numbers, but that would be kind of cool. That'd be a great undergrad student research project to go through and measure oil globules in all our samples, right? Um, but yeah, but it, it's interesting that the size, the actual size of the larvae is actually fairly conservative, even though, you know, we know that they provision their larvae with more energy, the size is, is pretty standard, which in other species it's not, right? There's a real trade-off. Yeah, I mean, that goes, you set that up, it's entirely focused on um, sort of internal energetics of the parent fish. Mm -hmm. What role does larval survival play in solving that? Hmm. Nothing. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so that's a very good question. So you could build in larval survival, right? You could definitely build that into the model. You could have, you could say, hey, if my larvae are produced in this month of the year, they're going to have better larval survival. I didn't want to make any assumptions about that. I actually don't know, right? Um, and maybe some of you all know a lot more about, you know, larval survival and when is the best time to reproduce. Yeah, um, I don't know. So I didn't want to build that into the model. We talked about it quite a bit. Um, this model is based off of the assumption that uh, fitness is driven by the number of eggs that you produce. That's it. Um, but you could definitely, if you had some information on, you know, how the larval survival, you could definitely, you could really easily build that in and see how it, how it, it changes, right? I mean, obviously, if you had like, oh, fish born in this month are going to have greater survival, that's going to drive a whole lot in your model. Um, so I didn't want to make that assumption. Um, I actually have the time, the, the seasonality, or the timing of reproduction is emergent property in this model um, based solely on the energetics. But yeah, there's a lot of things you could do with this model. Um, okay, and that would require a, you'd have to reframe the objective of the program at a population rather than the mm -hmm. middle level. Reframe the objective, no. Uh, you could just build that in a little tiny piece of code that would just say, hey, um yeah given because you're always going to know what month what month you're in so if it was a monthly thing you could just say hey if you reproduce in this month your larvae have a higher survival and so that's going to feed into your fitness function I, I have a couple, can I? yeah, yeah first thing i have to show that my biology is completely wrong but in your first example i think those were all um midwater species <laughs> as opposed to uh you know rock rock fish yeah. Born a rockfish. That's true. Um, and so my first question was, can we say anything about the the, the, the rockfish that are actually on the bend cost as opposed to in the midwater and whether there's anything special about them in water? And then I'll come to a question on the SD. SD. Anything special about the midwater in terms you know, of how the are outside the midwater species? For, for the SDP model? No, no, for the for the for the fecundities. Oh, so I, I'm not saying anything about variation in, outside of those four species. Um, they are I'm not quite sure how to answer that question. Um, but yeah, so they're midwater species. Uh, they they do have different life history characteristics. Um, 
we haven't really looked at, you know, variation in the in the, the fish that are associated more so with the um, with the uh, the benthos. I think what's really going to drive the differences is really, um, you know, also prey types, right? Like what they're eating is that more consistent throughout the year? Is it less consistent throughout the year? Um, and and body types and just I mean just their their life histories, how they store energy. Um, so are you thinking like what like what specific question on like what would emerge? in terms of just variation in brood size for, for those other species. Um, yeah, I think it could depend a lot on the energetics and what they're eating. Um, so especially like, you know, something like a chili pepper is eating like a lot of krill, you know, if they're eating kind of more towards the, the base of the food chain, maybe they're more influenced by, by variation, um, you know, seasonal variation in, in some of that, um, or something like, you know, a bocaccio rockfish, maybe that's why we don't see quite as much, you know, variation in brood size because they're feeding on you know, larger prey items, and maybe that's more dependent on, you know, what's there. Um, and also one thing that I didn't talk about is, you know, density dependence feeds in that to that as well. So um, we're looking at, you know, the amount of food that's incoming to this individual, which is going to be influenced by the, the environment, and then obviously competition and all that too, that um, we can't account for, but we do have measures of the condition of the individual. <laughs> there was a hand by the bench. It was a yeah, sure. um, thanks, Rita. Uh, I was thinking about your first uh, first piece, and um, I think I in interpreted one sort of maybe meta takeaway is that uh, large, like the L infinity fish, really fluctuate their energetic basically their fecundity, but you you learn later it was their mm -hmm. allocation. Um, and it got me thinking about like the body of work that says, hey, if you have a, um, a relatively pristine unfished population, that, that population can have lower recruitment variability, um, kind of through like portfolio effects, because bigger fish mm -hmm. for times. Da, da, da. Um, and I, I was interested in that conclusion in that context that would seem to actually pull it in the opposite direction. Where you would actually get more recruitment variability because you got these fish that can really ramp things up and things are good and then shut it down. They can, yeah, they they can really ramp things up. And then like right, like we we're we're not talking about larval survival and all of that. So in some regards, if it's a really pristine population, you know, maybe it, it doesn't matter how many eggs these are gonna produce because there's so much density dependence in like what eggs survive. Um, but I think there is something there, I think there still is something in that portfolio effect because it's like. These fish live in environments that could have really poor conditions over a long period of time. And like, really it's those, you know, large females that if they only have one good year in that set of, you know, 10 years, like the 1990s seemed to have like, you know, poor recruitment for all these fishes and the environmental conditions just seem to be really bad. You know, if you do have kind of that, that the ability of these large fish to really ramp up, you know, reproduction when that good time step comes along, um, you know, so they're still gonna be really important for kind of that overall storage effect. But I, that's a good point, you know, it's, it's, and some things in, in life history theory definitely kind of butt heads and you got to think about, you know, what what this really means. But, you know, what we're really seeing and even it's like even it's like the proportional amount of energy that these large fish, it's not like a, a similar proportion to the small fish. It's like way more energy. And, you know, and maybe some of that, you know, it's part of the life strategy that they that they get big. Right. And that they can have these energy stores like that's all built into the life strategy um, and, you know, based on the environment that they live in. So there, there's something to that, that, that um, you know, this variation in brood size is, you know, one part of their their life history that we ha we didn't know as much about. So so now that we know that it's so variable. How can we go back and, and kind of look at the other aspects of life history and, and think about that? I think that'd be great next to that step. Yeah. Will we optimize our food into it? Oh, yeah. That's right. Oh, there's one online. Um, uh oh. Yikes. I cannot. Can, could you read it? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. Temporal variation in egg size. So I think that was going back to uh, one of the first questions, and we do not see much evidence for temporal temporal variation in egg size. I know in other species that happens. I think is it guppies that, that, that there's a real trade off in size of larvae and numbers. That doesn't happen in in rockfish. It seems to be pretty conservative, um, the the size of the larvae when they're born. 
Okay, well, time to thank Sabrina.